us through an exercise, to a brief one at that, certainly not an exhaustive exercise, but a brief exercise, a little study on spiritual formation. Now that's a huge topic, and there's no way I'll unpack everything about spiritual formation in our life in four weeks. Uh, but I'm gonna spend four sermons talking to you a little bit about spiritual formation in your life. And what we're gonna look at is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're gonna see four practices that Jesus did in his life that we need to do in our life so that we can grow in our faith. Do you realize, guys, that God is in the process of transforming each and every one of us as believers? I mean, as Christ followers, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a transformation that started the day you accepted Christ as your Savior and then continues throughout the entire life that you live here on this earth earth to be ultimately completed obviously when we see the Lord and when we're with him in heaven and that transformation is God is in the process of conforming us into the image of his son right transforming and conforming us to be more like Christ that we are more like Christ in our actions more like Christ in our reactions more like him in our thought process more like him in our giving every single area of our life God is in the process of conforming us into the image of his son. You remember the great passage in Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be you what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Also over in 2 Corinthians, it talks about how, how we give God honor and glory by being conformed into the image of his son. So Christianity and saying that I am a Christ follower, it's more than just a one-time decision that we make. That's only the beginning. That gets us on the road. Now we've got to put an exercise and get in shape, spiritually speaking, whenever we think about the spiritual formation in our own life. Now, you're the one. talk about prayer, which I'm going to talk about today. We're going to talk about acts of service. We're going to talk about looking at the needs of others and trying our best to fulfill those needs. In other words, life is not about ourself. Hello? Life is just not about me and my form. Life is about acts of service, ministering to other people. We'll talk about that next week. Then we're going to talk about worship. What is worship? We're going to unpack that in week three. And then we're going to talk about solitude. Guys, do you realize it's important that you steal away? It's important that you turn off the devices. It's important that you have some quiet time in your life. And we're going to see how Jesus did that in the busy life that he had. So it's time for us to get in shape. Tap your neighbor on the shoulder right now and say, it's time for you to get in shape. Hurry, tell them. Tell them right now. Now tell them I'm talking about spiritually, right? I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually, it's time for us to get in shape. So that's what the title of this sermon series is, Shape Up. It's a study on the spiritual formation in our life. We're only going to look at four practices. I mean, good grief, you could preach on this the entire year. Uh, but we're only going to look at four practices, and then I'm going to move on to another series after that. But we're talking about prayer. We're going to be talking about service, talking about worship, talking about solitude. And we'll start unpacking all those together, okay? I want to talk to you briefly about spir spiritual formation. What is? How many of you? Of you, this is the first time you've heard that phrase, spiritual formation. Raise your hand. Some, several, more than, uh, more than just a couple. Yeah, that's kind of a, it's, it's not a new terminology. It's been around forever. It just we don't expound on it much. We don't think about it a whole lot. But there is a pattern. There are some things that we need to be setting up in our lives so that we can grow spiritually. Here's you a little bit of a working definition of the term spiritual formation that you may want to pay attention to. But it's simply Christian spiritual formation is the process. Everybody say process. process. It truly is that 
I want you to understand that spiritual formation, Christianity, being a Christ follower, it is a crock pot, not a microwave. Are you with me? Hello? You're not going to get it in, in one Sunday or one message or one prayer and think, whoop, that's it. I'm all that God wants me to be. No, it's a process. It is a crock pot. Another way of looking at it, it is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Okay? This is a long-term thing, right? So your spiritual formation, you've got the rest of your life. Now, that doesn't mean you wait to the end of your life to work on it. No, you work on it every single day. But it's a process that takes place, and that's what I want to see. But what is the process? What is taking place? The process is the fact that we are being conformed to the image of Christ, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be a little God here when you're on earth, right? So come down off your high horse. No, you're not going to be a little God, right? It means that we are being conformed into the image of Christ. And it's not even for our own glory, but it's for the glory of God. And you can see these two passages in Scripture that, that speak into spiritual formation. Romans 12 and 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. So everybody understand it's a process, right? In the process, we're being what? We're being, everybody say conformed. Conformed to what? To the image of, say it with me. To the image of Christ for our own glory. No, so that folks can come up to you and say, man, you have grown so much spiritually. No, it's not about that. It's for whose glory? It's for God's glory, right? So that's what spiritual formation is. And of course, the focal point of spiritual formation is the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us and directs us to become more like the person of Jesus Christ. Now, that's just a quick Brief definition of spiritual formation, if that is new terminology for you. So let's look at the big idea. The overall idea of this series is simply this. This four-week series, it's designed, I want you to see, to help us as Christ followers see that God's plan for us is to be transformed into the likeness of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing that, we're going to focus on these four practices that I've already shared with you that will help us to model our lives as Jesus lived his life so that we can be what God wants us to be in this life. You realize that God has a purpose and a plan for every single one of us, right? You understand that? And of course, generically or universally, it's that we are conformed to the image of his son. And then he has those specific areas that we're working in within our lives. So that's kind of the idea. Now, what is the idea for this particular message? Here's what I want you to get. Jesus gave some instructions to his disciples. And we're going to be in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6 here in just a moment. But he gave some instructions to his disciples about prayer. And he gave some serious implications for how we are to set our minds on the things of Christ. And we're going to look at that here briefly. And, of course, the application for this particular message that we're trying to... I'm, I'm trying to hit this nail right on the head, right? I don't know how many of you have ever done any carpentry work or construction work. And nowadays they have nail guns and air compressors and everything else. And, bat, 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 and just go. But back in the day when I was doing that, when I was a lot younger, you know, we didn't have all those fancy tools. We just had an apron on with a pocket full of nails and a hammer. Right? And when you held that nail, you wanted to hit the nail on the head. Not your thumb, although that happened from time to time. So that's the goal of what I'm trying to do. Here's the nail on the head for me in preaching this message and sharing this with you today. As we grow aware of Jesus in our lives, prayer, everybody say prayer, prayer. is going to be the primary conduit. It's the primary conduit that the Holy Spirit is going to use to connect with us so that we are conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, we must make a commitment to the practice of prayer. I wonder, how is our prayer life? Maybe it's time to shape up <clears throat> a little bit in spiritual formation. Number one, our prayer life. Are we spending time with God in prayer? Or every single day, do we have it on the calendar? I mean, if you're going to have a meeting with someone very important, you probably put that on your calendar. You may even prepare yourself mentally and physically and whatever else for that meeting that's very important that you're having that week, right? We've all been in those important meetings, right? And there's some preparation that goes in to those important meetings that we have. Now, I realize they're all needed in life. We need them, 
right? I'm in and out of them all the time. I understand that. But let me tell you something, honey. There is not one meeting that you will ever have on your calendar that will be more important than the meeting that you're going to have with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords every single day in prayer. Are you with me? So I want you, I want you to put the priority on our prayer time where it needs to be. So we've got to make a commitment that we are going to be consistent in the practice of prayer in our life. Guys, do you realize that prayer is critical to your spiritual well-being, Amen. to even your well-being? I mean, prayer is very, very important. Let me share with you a few quotes, and this is from N.T. Wright. And this is out of his commentary, Matthew for Everyone. And this is what he wrote. I, I was reading it this week, and I thought, man, that's just good. I want to share it with everyone. But here's a quote, and this is what he wrote in his book. He said this about prayer. He said, what you are in private is what you really are. Enough said. Conviction, right? <laughs> what you are in private is what you really are. Go into your inner room and talk to your father. You don't have to make a song and a dance about it. And indeed, the fewer people that know you're doing it, the better. Nor do you have to go on mounting pious phrases. You may find that there are forms of words which help as a framework or a starting point. And Jesus is about to give the disciples the framework that he particularly recommends. But the point is to do, everybody say this with me, business with God one on one or one to one. That's the point of our prayer time is that we are doing business with the Lord. He went on to say also in his writings, and I want to share this with you as well, talking about prayer, we're going to be talking about the Lord's prayer here in just a moment, but he went on to write this. He said, the pattern that Jesus gives, talking about the Lord's prayer that we're very familiar with, right? Our Father, which art in heaven, how, the Lord's Prayer, it really is the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer you'll find over in the Gospel of John, but this is a model prayer for us, but it's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer, so we'll use that terminology. Talking about the Lord's Prayer, he says this, the pattern that Jesus gives is like scaffolding in a building project, which gives people a place to stand while they do the building work. What the Lord's Prayer provides here what the Lord's Prayer provides here at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount is a framework. Jesus doesn't say you should always use identical words. It looks as though Jesus intended this sequence of thought to act more like the scaffolding than the whole building. I thought that was a pretty good way of looking at the Lord's Prayer. It's what we use to build the spiritual life that we're building in our own personal life to be conformed and be more like the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to know it's intentional. Your prayer time, you have to be very intentional with your prayer time on a daily basis. And the greatest task in prayer is seeing that God intends that we speak with Him. That's the most important thing that's taking place in our prayer time. And in that conversation, I want you to see that we're invited to be what? Intentional, right? When you pray, he starts out in Matthew chapter 6. Not if you pray, but when you pray. And all through Scripture, we can see where Jesus taught us and the Word of God has taught us that we are to be intentional with our prayer life. We just don't pray when we have a personal need, right? Right? We just don't pray when there's a crisis in our life. However, that's when most of us pray the most and how sad that is and how we all are kind of convicted over that. But we should have those moments in our life every single day where we are intentional about meeting with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that we are intentional about having a conversation with God. We are intentional about meeting Him in prayer. So with that being said, I want us to look in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. Okay, So turn in your Bibles there, look on the screen at the sermon notes I have for you, the notes I have for you online, your Logos Bible software app on your phone. You should be getting notifications right now if you're tracking with that. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 5. And there it is. This is G Remember, this is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave. And right in the middle of preaching this message to all of his followers, he says this. And when, everybody say when. And when, not if, but when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites. 
For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Verse 7, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. And in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It doesn't really end there in the Sermon on the Mount. The prayer ends there, but he adds an appendix to the prayer. In verses 14 and 15, this is an appendix, I believe, to verse number 12, when Jesus said, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He goes back and he unpacks that a little bit in verses 14 and verse number 15. Look what he said. And if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you f refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins. Um, I'm sorry, I missed that one, didn't I? 14, 15. You get it right there, okay? So the point is that we forgive. Now, here's what I want you to get. I want you to be sure today, at some time today or this week, I want you to go to my website, and I want you to look for this YouTube sermon series that we did years ago here at Victory Church on prayer, The Ultimate Conversation. In this series, we completely break down the Lord's Prayer for each and every one of us. And it was a, uh, I think it was like a 10 or 12 week study that we did here. And I've got YouTube small group video lessons that I put together and built. And uh, there's a link to it right at my website. If you, so if you go there, you'll see it. But here's what I want you to see. In the Lord's Prayer, you have these basic principles that were taking place. Re remember, we call this the Lord's Prayer. Really, it's the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found over in the Gospel of John. But this is the model prayer that we are to be praying, right? And here, here is how, the, how it's broken down, and here are the basic principles in the Lord's Prayer. First of all, it's a relationship, right? Our Father, right? We're talking about how we have a personal relationship with the Lord, our Father which art in heaven. Then worship comes into play. Hallowed be thy name. Holy, reverent is your name. There's in our prayer time, not only do we acknowledge that he is our father, not only do we acknowledge that we are his son or daughter, not only do we acknowledge that, hey, we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, with God the Father, but now we're entering into this moment of worship within our prayer time, and then we get to the place of obedience, thy kingdom come, right? So now we're looking at in the area of obedience, then it leads into submission, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then we go into forgiveness. We forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Then we get into the area of victorious Christian living where we simply state in the, in the prayer or in the thought process or the principle, if you will, that lead us not into temptation. And then protection is the last part that we're looking at when we ask that we, he deliver us from evil. That's a basic rundown of that 10 or 12 week sermon series that I want you to get. So if you want a good in-depth study on the Lord's Prayer, go to my website there and you can click on that link and go to my YouTube page and get that playlist about prayer, the ultimate conversations, complete study through the Lord's Prayer. That will be good for you as we're studying prayer. Now, today I want to look at a few instructions, actually four instructions that Jesus gave us in this Lord's Prayer that we need to apply to our life whenever we are entering into our prayer time, okay? Whenever we're praying, I want you to pay attention to these four instructions that the Lord gave us. Number one is simply this. We must pray in secret before we start praying in public, 
right? Pray in secret before we pray in public. I want you to look what he says in Matthew's gospel, chapter 6 and verse number 6. It says, but you, when you pray, do what? Go into your room or go into a secret place or go into a hidden place. In other words, get along, right? Start praying in secret before you pray in public. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father in the secret place. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. Now, just let me put in a disclaimer. It is not wrong to pray in public. It is not wrong when you go out to eat at a restaurant to bow your head in public and pray and ask God's blessings over the food. That is not wrong. It is not wrong to pray out loud, even in public, seeking God's help for a particular issue or set of circumstances that are taking place in your life. However, it is wrong if that's the only time we ever pray. Are you with me? It is wrong if praying in public is the only time that we're ever praying. You know what that's called? That's called being a hypocrite. That's called everybody else sees that we can pray, but we're not spending any quiet time with the Lord every single day in prayer. So it's not wrong to pray in public. It's not wrong to pray over your meals in public. It's not wrong to be in a situation with individuals and circumstances and you lead in a prayer over those for those individuals. When it becomes wrong is when we're not practicing prayer in our secret life. We're not practicing prayer quietly in our own life every single day with the Lord. It kind of tends to the fact that we're a little bit of a hypocrite, right? I want you to notice, if you will, in the New King James Version, which is what I'm using in this text, when it says room, but you, when you pray, go into your room, the word translated room just simply means a private chamber, okay? It doesn't mean necessarily that you have to get into your closet or go into an unoccupied room or whatever. It, it just means you need to go to a place in private and get along with the Lord. Another study on that, I don't have time to unpack it for you, but you'll read in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, that the Lord Jesus Christ, he went away privately to pray. You'll also see that Elisha went away privately to pray in 2 Kings, chapter 4. You also read that Daniel went away privately to pray in Daniel, chapter number 6. So all through Scripture, you can see these, these men of God and the Lord Jesus himself how they went away privately to pray. So whenever we're talking about spiritual formation, first of all, we're talking about our prayer life. And the first thing I want us to get is simply this, that we need to be praying in secret before we pray in public. Get it? Got it. Let's go on to number two right here, okay? Secondly, we must pray sincerely, all right? We must be praying sincerely whenever we pray. Look at Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8. And when you pray... Do not use, say this next two words with me, vain repetition. Say it again. Vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for the Father knows the things you have need of before you even ask. He's simply saying right here is that I want you to be sincere in your prayer. I just don't want you to pray a bunch of memorized words and just repeat them over and over and over and over and over again to where it's almost like the old, uh, uh, some of you young ones aren't going to remember this, although they're coming back in today. Yeah, I remember back when I was in high school, all the new records and the new albums came out on Friday. And we would make a mad dash to the music store on Friday night or Friday afternoon to get the new albums that were coming out. Does anybody relate with me at all about that? Some of you guys, I can't really see your hands, but some do. Yeah. I mean, there was no download. There's no MP3s. There's no Spotify and YouTube, all this other stuff. I mean, the vinyl came out, right? And we would run to the record store and we would buy with fan through those new albums and we would open them up. You could smell it when you open up the album cover and then it had all the lyrics of all the songs in there. You guys remember that? Then you'd go home on Friday night, and after you were out spending the evening with your friends and what have you, you would sit in your bedroom, you'd put that album on your record player, and you'd dust off that needle, and <laughs> you ever do that? You're not supposed to do that, but you do that, and you blow it, and you put the needle right on the edge of that album, and it just starts playing that music through those little dinky speakers that you had, right? But boy, did that music sound so good, right? So we put the needle on the album and just let it play. Well, unfortunately, 
a lot of people's prayers are just like that. We've got this recorded prayer in our mind that whenever we're called on to pray, that's the prayer that we pray. Dust off the needle. That's how you did it back in the day. I don't know if you guys know that or not, right? You older folks in here, you, you're tracking with me. You pick it up, not too far, you break the lever. Did you guys do that? I can't see you. Did you guys do that? Yeah, we dust off that needle, put it on that LP, and just let it play. Well, unfortunately, a lot of people have prayers just like that. Now, I want to say this also, though. The fact that whenever you pray and you re repeat a request to God over and over and over again until he answers that prayer, you're praying it in faith. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about vain repetition, right? Because Scripture says that we're to stand at the door and we're to, we're to knock, right? And, and we're to stay there and we're, we're, to, we're to look and search and see and knock and, and everything until we get an answer from the Lord, right? So I'm not talking about praying about something over and over and over. I'm talking about this glorified prayer of words that we have memorized that we put together and that we use to prayer. I've got a little quote here for you I want you to see. A request becomes a vain repetition if it only is babbling words without a sincere heart desire to seek and to do God's will. It's just words that are spoken. The heart's not tied into it. We're not connected to it emotionally. We're not passionate really about it. It's just this is our recorded prayer. As a matter of fact, someone once said, and I, I found this quote this past week, all of us have one routine prayer in our system. And once we get rid of it, then we actually can start to pray, right? So you may start off with that routine prayer, but I hope you get rid of that real soon. And you get sincere with the Lord about your prayers. We've got to pray sincerely. Let me give you number three. Not only do we pray in secret, not only must our prayer be prayed sincerely, Jesus taught us, but in verses 9 down through verse number 13, we must pray in God's will, right? Not our will be done, but your will be done. As it's done in heaven, may your will be done here in my life, here on this earth. Look what he says in Matthew 6, verse 9. And in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your, your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he goes on, he talks about the daily bread and asking for forgiveness and not being led into temptation. The point I want you to get is whenever we go to God in prayer, we got to pray for the Lord's will to be done. Now I realize that we go to God in prayer for a lot of different things. And those may be things that we're passionate about and things that we're, we want so bad we can taste it. But here's the point where we've got to get as a Christ follower. It may not be God's will. You get it? I, I want you to get this now, okay? Whenever we're praying, when we finish praying, we got to say, Lord, not my will but may your will be done in my life. You see, there may be a direction that we're wanting to go. There may be something that we're wanting to do. And we're doing everything else, spiritually speaking, the best we know, right? We're being faithful in our service to the Lord and our prayer time and reading God's word and all of this. But in our minds, we're thinking, this is the direction I want to go. And for whatever reason, we may be hitting a, a closed door. And have you ever thought that maybe it's not God's will that you go that way? I can't tell you how many times, numerous times in my own personal Christian life that that has happened. In my mind, I want to go this way, even in leading this church. I didn't know from the beginning when we started this church in Mascouda, there was no intent to move it to O'Fallon. I tried everything to keep the church in Mascouda but was told no, 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 numerous times from the city council. You cannot build. You cannot build. You cannot build. I had no other choice. I said, okay, Lord, I don't know what to do. And I kind of threw my hands up, submitted to the Lord. Okay, God, what is your will for our church? Over a series of events, we find this place, and ultimately this is where we planted and built the church, right? So I just want you to see, even in your own personal life, you're going to have ways that you're going that you think this is the way that God would want me to go. So you think. 
But if you keep going that way, and if the door does not ever open, I want you to stop beating your head against the door. I want you to stop pushing and trying to break the door down. I want you to stop, back up, get on your knees, and say, okay, God, what is your will for my life? Because apparently what I thought was the direction we should go is not the direction we should go. You getting this, guys? So here we must pray in God's will. That's a big part of prayer, is that we're praying that the Lord's will would be done in our heart. The Lord's will be done in our life. The Lord's will be done in our family. The Lord's will be done in our home and in our jobs and community and our church, whatever the case may be. We've simply got to pray, may your will be done and not mine. And who else prayed something like that? You guys know it. Jesus did, right? When he looked in the cup, he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He sweat. It became big drops of blood right before he was handed over to die that weekend on the cross. And he saw what was going to take place in his own life. And finally he said, God, not my will, but your will be done. That's the model. And he gave it to us here, here again in the Lord's Prayer. We need to pray that God's will be done in our life. So the prayer begins with God interest, not our own. It's God's name. It's God's kingdom. It's God's will. Robert Law said this, thinking along these lines, that prayer is a mighty instrument, not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will done on earth, right? So think about that whenever you are praying. Be sure that you're praying in the will of of the Lord. Let me give you number four here. This is the last one. He gave us four instructions to guide us in our prayer life. One that we pray in secret, not necessarily always in public, that we pray sincerely, that we pray in God's will. And number four is simply this we must pray having a forgiving spirit toward others. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. Scripture says, If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow, this is a big one. we got to pray having a forgiving spirit towards others. Now let me ask you this. Have any of you guys ever been hurt by someone? Don't raise your hand. Just think about it. Have you? Has someone ever offended you? Has someone ever in intentionally set out to maybe destroy your path or your walk? or to cause havoc in your life. Have you ever had any of that in your life? Most of us probably have experienced something like that, right? Let me tell you why. It's called, four-letter word for it. It's not the one you're thinking. Four-letter word for it, life, L-I-F-E. You're going to run across individuals from time to time for whatever reason, whether intentionally or unintentionally, they're going to cause great pain in your life. It's going to cause hardship in your life, right? You know what Scripture tells us we got to do? In our own mind, we've got to forgive them. Now, it doesn't mean that we go to them and we're all lovey-dovey and huggy and we become best friends and we keep hanging out. No, there may be some lines that have been crossed where that relationship is severed, but in my own mind... I've got to forgive. Let me tell you why. Because here's what I know. And I know this because I've experienced this. If you do not forgive, you're only hurting yourself. Because they're out there living their life, doing their thing. They're going their way. They don't even have you in the rearview mirror, right? But you're thinking about it all the time. You're rehashing that event all the time. You know what you're doing? You're incarcerating your own spirit and your own soul. You're, you're causing yourself stress and fatigue and worry and sickness <laughs> because you cannot let it go. You're eventually going to turn into a bitter, bitter, hard person. Why? Because you haven't forgiven. Now, some people say, well, you got to forgive and you got to forget. I don't know that I go that far. Hello? Hello? There's some things I remember. I think there's some wisdom in that. Because fool me once, shame on me, or shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Is that how it goes? 
right? I mean, we got to learn some lessons at some point, right? So I'm not saying you've got to forgive and forget and act like it never happened. No, whatever happened, God can use that to mold you and shape you and make you a stronger Christ follower than you were. But you got to get to the place in your own mind where you're like, you know what? I've forgiven them in my mind, in my heart. They're done. It's over. I'm moving on. I'm not going to rehash that. But then here's what I've discovered. There are different events that will come up in your life that will remind you. (laughs) Am I the only one that ever experiences this? That will remind you of the hurt that that individual caused in your life. And then you get angry again. Come on, guys. Am I the only one that ever does this? Have you guys ever done this? Yeah, we have. You may tell you why? Because that's what Satan does. He wants to incarcerate your spirit. He wants to make you a bitter, nasty, mean, hard, ugly, on the inside, not talking about your appearance, ugly person, right? Don't give him that much control. Don't give them that much control over your life. Amen? Be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. If there's anybody who has reason not to forgive, it's the Holy Spirit. It's God the Father. It's God the Son. It's our Lord, right? But He forgave. Therefore, we need to forgive. It will be liberating when you can get there. That's not, now here's the deal. You're going to have to maybe forgive numerous times that event, that person, that individual for that one thing that they did that keeps coming back to your remembrance. You guys picking up what I'm laying down? I'm just trying to be real with you. I mean, these are things that I've experienced in my own life. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I've got to forgive them again. Lord, God, please help me forgive them, right? right? We've been there, right? But you got to do it. Now, here's, here's what I want you to see real quickly. And this is kind of off the chart a little bit. But I want you to see here what he is not teaching. I want you to see what the teaching is here. Because some people take this sometimes out of context. He is not teaching that believers earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others. That's not what he's teaching. He's not teaching that we earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others. Why? That would be contrary to God's grace and God's mercy. That would be a works salvation. We're not saved by our good works. Are you with me? So this is not a matter of salvation. This is a matter of victorious Christian living. Are you with me? So if we want to live victoriously in our Christian life, then we've got to learn to forgive other people. We don't have to like them. We don't have, I guess we do have to love them. (laughs) We don't have to like that we love them. (laughs) You know what I'm getting though, right? So you've got to forgive over and over and over and over again so that you can live a victorious Christian life. Not for your salvation. Don't blur the lines there, right? Uh, We're saved by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, plus and minus nothing, right? There's nothing you can do that you can't work good enough to be saved. You can't turn over enough new leaves to be saved. You can't be baptized enough to be saved. You can't take communion enough to be saved. All these things. No, no. You are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ himself and the finished work of Calvary, plus and minus nothing in your life other than trusting in Christ and your Savior and asking for forgiveness of of, of your sins, right? That's how we come to Christ, by faith. So if we look at this verse of Scripture, we say, boy, you, you can't even enter heaven. You're not even saved. Then I think we're taking the entire doctrine of soteriology completely out of context, right? You've got to be careful there. If you forgive those who sin against you, then your heavenly Father will not forgive you. In other words, you're going to be right there. You're going to be a miserable, hard person. You're not going to be in, in good fellowship with the Lord. You're not going to be experiencing Christian, victorious Christian living there. In other words, you're going to be on the on the backside of Jordan where Moses and Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh camped out and stayed and did not go into the promised land. Guys, you do know the promised land that's talked about back in the Old Testament, that is not a type of heaven. Please understand that. People get messed up right there. Oh, the promised land, that's a type of heaven. No, it's a type of victorious Christian living because there's one patriarch of the faith that didn't go to the promised land. Tell me who that was. Moses. Is Moses not saved? You don't think we'll see Moses in heaven? Yeah, I know we'll see Moses in heaven, right? So the promised land is victorious Christian living. So for us to live in victory, then we've got to learn to forgive and move on, right? 
That's about as simple and as down. That's cookies on the bottom shelf stuff right there, guys. That's about as low down as I can put them chocolate chip cookies. I hope you got one of them. Hello? Four things we need to do in order to have spiritual formation take place in our life. The application here I want you to get. What are the four things? Let me get. I think I got a slide for that. Maybe I do. Yeah, here are the four things we need to get. We got to pray in secret before we start pr praying in public, right? So be sure that you're praying in secret. Number two, we got to pray sincerely, not just vain repetition. It's, it's from the heart. We're communing with God. We're talking with Him. We're he knows what we're in need of before we even ask, but He wants us to ask, right? <laughs> Let me share a little story with you, and I'm going to close. We were, we go to our house on Sunday afternoons for dinner, and and Will and Kristen and Tyler and Megan and Quincy and Marlo and now Renly all come over to the house, meet after church on Sunday. Except for today. We're not doing it today. They all got appointments, things they got to go do today. <laughs> Most of the time, they come over to the house on Sunday. The other day, we were sitting there and um, we were eating. And I can't remember what the meal was, but it was being served. And, and uh, Debbie had made fettuccine for Quincy and, and Marlo. And it was delicious. And nobody's really talking to Quincy about anything. She's just eating. We're all having conversation. Out of the blue, Quincy rises up. She says, and by the way, Debbie knows, and we call her, that's Mama. Mama knows that Quincy loves fettuccine, right? Because they've already had that conversation way back. Anyway, Quincy's sitting there in her little chair at the table. We're all in conversation. The conversation kind of comes to a law. Quincy says, Mama. She looks up and she said, you got to know this too before I say it. Our, in our family, everybody gets a birthday meal, right? So wherever anybody chooses to go out to eat or whatever they want to have fixed at the house, that's up to them. Nobody can complain about it. We all go there. We all eat it. It's whatever. That individual gets to choose what they want for the birthday meal. Quincy has tapped into that, and she said, Mama, she said, for my birthday, I want, will you make me, she said, that, will you make me fettuccine? You, Mama's heart melted like you wouldn't believe. She said, yes, Quincy, I'll definitely make you fettuccine. And then the whole next week, Debbie told me, she said, John, did you hear what Quincy said? And her heart was melted, and she's oohing and eyeing over what her granddaughter had asked her to do. And she said, I'm definitely going to make her fettuccine. Here's my point. God, our Father, is the same way. He knows what we're in need of. He knows what we love and what we like. He knows what we need in every particular moment. But you know what he wants? He wants us to sincerely ask him for those things. And then his heart melts for us because he wants to bless us. Probably more than we want to be blessed, but he wants to bless us. He wants to encourage us. He wants to give us those things that we need of, but he wants us to ask him for it and submit to his lordship. There's a whole lesson there, but I hope and pray that you'll take these four things in your life. They will help you to become closer to the Lord, to become more like Christ, in this spiritual formation, prayer is an important part. Now, this is a brief, brief lesson on prayer. There's a lot more that can be said. And please, go to my YouTube channel. Get that whole 10 or 12 sermon series, whatever it is. It's linked for you there on my website. You can click it and go straight there and get the whole playlist. Listen to that. It really unpacks the Lord's Prayer for you. It'll help you in your prayer time, okay? So let's pray together. If you have any request or any need, uh, please connect with me there.